Hey everyone, and welcome to this very special uh, last minute uh, edition of the podcast. Uh, for those who are watching live, obviously, well, hopefully some folks will also watch after. Uh, I'm, as always, I'm Abram Felch, editor-in-chief of Tom's Hardware, and I'm joined, as always, by Raspberry Pi expert Ash Puckett and associate editor Les Pounder. But we also have Paul and John from Pimeroni joining us today, which is always a great privilege um, because my house is like a Pimeroni house now. Like everything, like... Over the holidays, my son and I just got a slew of Pimeroni, Pimeroni stuff and played with it. So I have like the mood light over here. And I got like a, the scroll bot and the Kibo and whatever. And we were like, you know, putting together all kinds of crazy stuff. But this is a really special occasion because today is the launch of a brand new Raspberry Pi board and a brand new type of Raspberry Pi board, the Raspberry Pi Pico, which uh, Les will show you there. Uh, that's like a really nice picture of it. Um, so this board is the first, for those who are not familiar with everything about it, it is the first board to use Raspberry Pi silicon. It uses Raspberry Pi's own 20 RP2040 CPU, which is going to be in a slew of other boards besides the Pico. Uh, and it is not like a regular Raspberry Pi because you, you it's more like an Arduino uh, in that you use it uh, as a, it's a microcontroller. It doesn't boot Linux, doesn't boot an operating system. You just you just program it using either C or MicroPython, and you and you use it to control lights, motor sensors, and a variety of stuff. So it's really exciting. Les, you've been playing with a playing with the Pico for a while. What do you think of it? Fantastic bit of kit. Um, $4, so £3.60 in the UK. Brilliant. We've got official hardware, so we're not buying a clone board, such as an Arduino clone or something weird and wonderful like that. It's proper real hardware that's built for a task. Admittedly, it hasn't got all the, the whiz-bang stuff like uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, but for basic microcontroller work, $4.00. If it's in a breadboard and it's easy to use with micro Python and C, it just works. It's great fun and a great way to get started with physical computing. Yeah, and you know, because it's Raspberry Pi, you know there's a huge ecosystem of stuff. In fact, holy cow, stuff we didn't even know about uh, came out just today, and Pimeroni has a ton of, uh, of, of, so do we pronounce it Pico or Pico? It's Pico. Pico. I believe. So a yeah. ton of Pico if, if you're in New York, you can do Pico, right? Yes. I still have yeah. to explain to people that it's that's Pimeroni, not Pimeroni. Uh, we've, yeah. we've, we've, we've given up that fight. We just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I chose I, wisely. Yeah, I, 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 ex, I explained that. To, I've explained, I had to explain that to a few people. Uh, my son and I just got used to it. We're like, okay, Pimeroni. So, uh, so tell us, guys, what what do you have what are the what are some of the great new products that you have coming out for for pico i think um a good start point for getting into that is the fact that when we heard about pico and we heard about the rp2040 the chip on it um it was a very exciting opportunity to try some new things and also to take things that we'd done before on the pi into a, in, in a slightly new direction on a platform where arguably it makes more sense so you will see there's quite a lot of respins of kind of existing products that we have, but also some completely different directions. Uh, and I'm sure Paul will be happy to tell you about some of that. Yeah. So the, this this is a breadboardable thing. Using basic components with it, go knock yourself out. It's a great way to play with stuff. We're doing that thing where we're kind of on one hand, we're helping people who don't want to kind of get too soldery, too messy with things like uh, the unicorn and the scroll. Um, and then the other side of it, we're making the stuff with the chip. But if we talk about the kind of help stuff we're doing, uh, so if you look at the unicorn, that makes a very thin sandwich with the Pico. And that's very embeddable, and you can build any number of little embedded projects with that. Uh, same with the kind of audio boards, uh, the scroll, 
the wireless, which is somewhere around here and coming soon. These are all little helper boards just to kind of start playing with it in a way that's uh, easy to get used to. And then we have the omnibus, so you can split out the pins and just kind of have a Pico in the middle, uh, a board over here, and then put jumper jerky or pin headers there, really. Yeah. And the, I think, yeah um, we don't need... Sorry, the, the Unicorn Mini is quite an interesting case because it takes advantage of the PIOs on the RP2040. Uh, one of the most exciting features, and you'll see it talked about a lot on things like the Hackaday articles and in the uh, Raspberry Pi blog post, is that the RP2040, which is the processor, the MCU that's on the Pico, has a feature called PIO. And effectively, you can write very small programs that run completely independent of the main ARM cores. And those programs can toggle GPIO pins, they can stream data in and out, they can do some very basic manipulation of information. Um, these things are tiny, like 32 instructions long, and you write them in assembly. But for something like Unicorn, it allows us to perform all of the updates of the screen completely independent of the CPU cores. There is, there's literally no load on this Pico, really. You know, it's, it's just sitting there doing nothing while the PIOs do the updates. And because they're so fast, we can actually update this screen uh, at a resolution of 14 bits. Like your classic LED drivers tend to be 8-bit. And they are very poor at the low end because um, LEDs aren't linear. Effectively, they, they they ramp up brightly very early on in, in the amount of current you give them. And then they kind of level out. And that means that classic or cheaper LED drivers tend to have this curve where you, you get a really quick spike of brightness and then uh, a very sluggish response at the high end. Um, but because of the PIOs, we could actually directly drive the LEDs. No LED driver is involved. We just use, you know, um, column and row driving FETs, basically. Uh, the PIOs do all the work, and that allows us to gamma correct the 8-bit data that we send to our display into 14-bit output on the LEDs, which gives a much better quality of light. And it's just cool stuff like that that you can do with this that you could never do directly on a Raspberry Pi or without paying for very expensive LED drivers. So does that mean you would get less flicker? Because uh, I know one of the problems I've had in using like my Adafruit bonnet with with an LED matrix is you get you get a fair amount of flicker. These you get basically very very little amount of flicker. I don't know how technical you want me to get, but effectively we process uh, something called binary coded modulation, which is we output for every frame that we draw. We actually output fourteen different frames, and they all take a different period of time. And by combining those frames, you effectively set the brightness of the LED. Um, that entire process of updating the whole screen for 14 frames takes four milliseconds on this device. So it's a, a, you know it's a 120 odd pixels. I can't remember the exact number, um, but effectively we're updating the entire screen 250 times a second. You're not going to notice any flicker. Well, you can kind of see as I wave it on the camera, which is traditionally an awful. Uh, Thing to do with LEDs that are not refreshing very quickly. It actually tracks very nicely. Yeah, so I couldn't help but notice, I think, that you have both uh, soldered the pins where the long part is. Is it correct to say you like to solder the pins with the long part on the bottom? Yeah, on yeah. the bottom of the Pico. Yeah. Yes, and actually that is guidance that has come from Raspberry Pi because they have said kind of like, you know, for consistency and if a headed version comes out in the future, that's how the orientation will be. Aha. Uh -huh. That's good to note. I think, I think you settled the disagreement so say that. <laughs> between Les and myself because, oh, no, no, wait a second. I'm wrong. I did it. Yes. Les, Les, was, Les was correct and I was wrong. I soldered it so that the uh, the pins are coming up, and he soldered it so that the pins are going down. There's one very good reason for doing it this way, and that is that the boot select pin would be uh, button would be unavailable. So to yeah. get back to the FU mode, you have to hold this switch down while you power cycle the device. So obviously, if we flipped it, it would be trapped in between the sandwich. Yeah, I I did it the opposite way with mine simply because I wanted to see. When I put it on the breadboard, I wanted to see the the GPIO markings. So, yeah, I can I can totally see that. And obviously, due to the 
the components on the top side, they don't have the kind of individual pin markings on that side of the silk screen. Um, but this is definitely kind of the official uh, way to take it. So now, Pimaroni, you're making your you're making your own RP twenty forty board, correct? We are making a few actually. We've got the uh, tiny twenty forty because we we wanted a, a very small, compact version of effectively the Pico, but with a reduced number of pins. Uh, and there are a couple of other things we wanted, uh, which was specifically a larger flash and USB C. So what what will you do with the reduced number of like how how does having less pins affect it? Well, I mean, obviously, it kind of depends on your project. So if you're trying to drive something like a, a parallel display that needs a 16-bit parallel bus, you need the pins. But for so many projects these days, you're you're working with kind of serial digital interfaces like I squared C and SPI. You can get away with very little pins these days for for most things. So having something that's super compact just makes it easier to integrate into a project. It's just a, a nice tidy format, we think. Great. What are the other boards that you're uh, that you're coming out with? We have. Um, I don't have one of them, but I think Paul may, so he could show that. I think. Um, but we have a tiny little kind of games console, which is meant to be super bare bones. You know, it's basically controls a small screen and a, a piezo speaker. You know, it, it, this this was kind of thrown together, I guess, a little bit in the frustration of how complex our other handheld console project has been. Which is something we've been working on for months and has massive feature set in comparison. Uh, so this was kind of, I guess, venting a little bit to say, I wish, I wish <laughs> you know, at least what it is. What what kind of games would one play on that? You could you could do a lot with this. To be honest, I'm trying to find my USB C cable. It's, I just pulled it out. Um, we've set it up so that. Um, basically, there's a very basic API. You can do things like draw rectangles, set pixels, blitz sprites, uh, do basic audio. Um, but you know anything that would be suitable on, say, the Pico 8 platform, almost certainly could be implemented on uh, on this little guy. I've just realised I don't actually have any firmware flashed for it, which is not very helpful. Yeah, in a few weeks it'll it'll be kind of out there and in all its glory. Fantastic. Kind of oh. well, so you, is, is it running? Yeah, you can very easily do kind of graphical effects games. The the, the processor, the RP twenty forty is is pretty powerful. You know, it's dual core, one hundred thirty three megahertz. It's got plenty of grunt to hmm. update a screen. You know, manage some game states. It's got nearly three hundred kilobytes of RAM. You know, it's pretty generous. So you can do a lot with that. Yeah, and if you're offloading. Things like the peripheral functions. That means everything's a lot cleaner in your main code. It's yeah, definitely. The the nice. specifically on Pico system, we do quite a nice trick. The display is two forty by two forty, but that would mean you'd need a very large frame buffer, and obviously you have constrained RAM. So what we've done is we've pixel doubled everything on the screen. So actually, it's a really small frame buffer. It's one hundred twenty pixels by one hundred twenty pixels, which is nice in that you know sometimes constraints actually bring out more ingenuity and creativity. It means that you don't have to be quite so talented when you're trying to design sprites and things. You can get away with a lot more at these smaller kind of pixel sizes. But we actually use the PIOs on the RP2040 again here to do the pixel doubling. So the CPU isn't burdened with, you know, doubling up every pixel on SPI rights to the screen. We just offload that all to the PIOs and, and let it happen in the background. Great. So one of the uh, one of the products on your site I noticed is you have a an ex what's it called the Explorer board where you're able to actually you have the screen and you're able to plug in a couple of different breakout garden connections too, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so this is fantastic. we did the Explorer and uh, Les knows it very well for the Pi. Uh, we've upgraded it a bit for the uh, Pico and it's it's suddenly come into focus having that screen on there. And having a few bits in there means it, it is a good kind of single playground for everything you want to do embedded wise. And just being able to see the output of things on the screen and just play with it in front of you makes it just a pleasant and wonderful experience. Just for anybody developing, anyone who's coming from the software world or educational stuff, this is, yeah, 
I think Les, you're, you're going to like it a lot. Thank I you very so. much. I appreciate that. Has it got a, a library, uh, like a Python library to work with it? So you just have to, you know, have an abstraction to go straight into it? It has full support in C++ and also in MicroPython. The screen's quite bright, isn't it? But this is just a little test of our graphics library. Uh, we've nice. got an accelerometer running there. That's kind of a dot moving around on the screen to track its movement. Brilliant. You've got an HBridge Geo motor driver in there as well, haven't you? There's yeah. two, yeah. Lovely. Robots, yeah. Oh, fantastic. So is this going to be immediately compatible with all of your breakout garden boards or will there need to be software development? <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. Yeah, yeah I think uh, realistically over the next couple of days, we're going to have kind of 10 to 15 breakouts supported. Um, a lot of, you know, we haven't had much time to work on a lot of this. And obviously the hardware development cycle is, is quite long, uh, especially if you have to do multiple spins and, and prototyping. Um, but yeah, we, we have, I think at the moment, we've got five of our existing breakouts working with it. We can quite quickly add another 10 or so, and then we'll start chipping away at the ones that are a little bit more awkward. The intention is to fully support Breakout Garden on Pico, though. Uh, fantastic. Breakout, breakout fact, Garden is such an amazing a, interface. We have a Breakout Garden for Pico coming next week. That looks awesome. Yeah, uh, you can make a little skyline of Breakouts. <laughs> Build your own San Francisco. <laughs> it's all good. Fa fantastic. Uh, I mean, breakout gar breakout garden is is such a, such a fun thing to play with. My my eight year old son. We got a bunch of breakout garden stuff in like a couple weeks ago, and he wanted to play with it. And he said, and I was working. I was actually I think last week I was working, and I was like, listen, I can't I can't set this up for you right now. I was like, no, no, I'll do it. And so I gave him all the pieces and the and the hat. And he like, you know, when I came emerged for dinner a couple hours later, he was like, yeah, so let me show you this. And he like, he had it all set up and he had the uh, accelerometer, excel, the, had the accelerometer working and the 240 by 240 screen working. Mm -hmm. And he was showing me uh, the, the compass demo that you, that you guys have. And he was like, yeah, you know, it was pretty easy, but I had to find the instructions on GitHub. I was like, well, that's where you're going to find a lot of instructions. Yeah, it sounds um, like yeah. he's going to do all right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, show so Stack Exchange as well, and that's it. He's working in IT in no time. Stack. He's seen things on Stack Overflow. Like he miles ahead. He he like because he'll just Google things, and I, I guess I should worry about him finding things he shouldn't on Google. But he'll just Google things, and he'll come back to me and be like, "Yeah, that problem that you had, I looked it up, and I found this page on Stack Overflow that solves it." That's so sweet. Yeah, he, I've got to say, I've ahead of me now. Yeah. You know, whatever you do, he's going to find out about JavaScript eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we did talk. I mean, I taught him some some JavaScript because he likes to use it with. Uh, he likes he he really likes to to create controllers for things in Flask. So mm -hmm. I explained to him how like you can use HTML and JavaScript on your Flask page. So uh, he even yeah. showed off how to set up and use Flask on the podcast for us, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. So he's he's really excited about the Pico. He's uh, he and I actually created a created a like a Simon game on it, where it actually you know like the old, although not not well designed, just sort of on a breadboard. So uh, so it's uh, it's been really cool. What are some of the projects that you've seen people do? I mean, it's just come out, so probably not a lot. Not much. We've we've had some uh, insight, obviously. Uh, under our NDA with Raspberry Pi to the development of the SDK, and, and we've been working alongside that for the last couple of months. So we, we see some of the demos their engineers are doing, and they're incredible. Things like uh, HDMI output, DVI output, uh, just just crazy tricks, mostly lean on the, the functionality of the PIOs, actually. I keep saying that word, and I sound like a broken record, but they are very, very cool. Well, it's yeah. interesting you say about VGA output. You've got a, a, a demo-based board, haven't you, to break that out really easy. We have. I lent mine to the photography department, and I haven't had it back yet. <laughs> oh, Paul's got one. So I've seen video focus. today. Uh, I've seen a video today about the Pico running um, DVI video on dual screens. Yep. But yep. also, someone uh, has emulated a, a BBC Micro, a bit shifter, I think it was. So a BBC mm -hmm. Micro, the 1980s home computer, mm -hmm. and running a, a live demo on it, and it's just amazing. It's a four-dollar computer, and it's doing that. So. Yeah. 
why would you want to i mean this is a microcontroller why would you want to output it to a screen i think well for one it's just cool right mm -hmm. you've got this tiny little chip that shouldn't be able to do this and you can mm -hmm. bend it to your will and, and do something like that but i think this utility i you know with the pico system you can kind of toy around with the idea of creating uh, something that's very reminiscent of, of say a kind of 80s console just with the rp2040 you know you, you stick it straight into the back of the tv on a hdmi stick and write games that are as um competent as the nes or snares quite quite straightforward and i think that's pretty cool actually yeah no no doubt so what do you think i mean people are obviously going to ask the question you can get a raspberry pi zero for for five dollars and you can get this for four dollars what would you use the Pico Four that you wouldn't use a regular Raspberry Pi for. There's there's a number of very key differences, and I think the reality is they're completely different beasts. So if you have a project in mind, one is clearly going to be the correct choice, and and it won't take many kind of searching questions to decide which that is. Uh, the Pico runs at massively low power budget than the Zero, so if you're battery powered, it's it's immediately attractive. Um, the Pico is designed for kind of real-time, cycle-accurate um, manipulation of the GPIOs, if that's what you need. You can't really do that on the Zero. Um, the Zero runs a full Linux stack, which in some cases is great. You know, you get networking, you get all the rest of it. But actually, for a lot of projects, it's just a pain to have to deal with all of that. You'd, you'd rather write, you know, some simple code that runs straight on the metal and uh, does what you need it to do. I think you're quiet. Everyone's muted himself. Take <laughs> over. <laughs> Sorry. Just in case over yeah. Um, uh, the Kibo is a case in point. I mean, that's that's the 2040 version. It's a lot thinner. It's going to be easy to program. It won't have a boot time. And it's four by four, but I think the price will be a little less than the Pi Zero kit. And it's just a lot cuter and a lot more fun to play with. So that's case in point for us of the yeah. difference between Zero and Pico. Or RP twenty forty. That's uh, that. That's funny. I have my uh, my key my keyboard right here. Uh, uh, the uh, yeah, we 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 really enjoyed uh, we really enjoyed setting this up. And uh, my son was like, "Oh, hey, you can program the keys in Lua, which he which he likes because he uses that for Roblox." Uh, so it's like, "Oh yeah, Lua. I like Lua, you know." But. Uh, yeah, I, I can see it'll be a lot thinner. It'll be a lot thinner. And I guess you're getting you're getting more keys because you have four by four. Yep. That that's kind of arbitrary. I mean, it's only yeah. three by four on the Pi because that's yeah. roughly the size of a hat, right? Yeah. It it just fits the form factor. But I think the key point for Paul was kind of like the second we saw Pico and the RP twenty forty, it was immediately obvious that was a better choice for Kibo. And the thing that makes it exciting is not that microcontrollers didn't exist before. It's that Raspberry Pi get how to support this stuff for people like me and Paul, you know, for makers. They don't send out weird, obtuse data sheets that are borderline impossible. They, they, the, the quality of documentation for Pico and RP2040 is frankly incredible. It's a game changer in this space. That was led by uh, Alistair Allen, wasn't it? If it was, he deserves a medal because it's incredible. Every last bit of it. It's done really well. Yeah. I've been re re referring to that for the last two weeks, and it answers every single question in depth. But, Most data yeah. sheets literally just tell you the absolute bare minimum oh, yeah. to provide the truth of what the situation is, whereas their documentation kind of asks the question why and gives you some examples of how, and and it's you know properly formatted and you know written in, in fluent readable english it's 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 a complete step change and then when you look at things like the sdk they've transferred that kind of humanity of the documentation into the code itself the function names are consistent they don't have some massive abstraction layer over everything that makes it impenetrable you know you, you download the dev kits for other well-known manufacturers of microcontrollers and you've got like 200 megabytes of code, mostly just abstracting the fact that they have 37 different ways they implement SPI interfaces on their range of 300 different chips. You know, it's Pi, Pi are lucky in some respects that they've come to this completely fresh and they've got a completely blank slate. They can start from scratch and they don't have the kind of uh, baggage that other 
chip manufacturers do, um, but it really shows, and I think to our benefit is the point. You know, you and me and and everyone else who plays with this stuff is going to have a much better time than they probably will on other platforms. So we have a question from Tim who asked, do you recommend Linux or Linux-based OS when working in the microcontroller environment? Is that definitely MC microcontroller environment? I don't know. Um, no, no, he says MC environment. Does it not mean microcontroller? Not, uh, yeah, maybe. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I've done all of my development so far using Windows subsystem for Linux. So basically under Linux, it's worked really nicely. Hmm. Uh, I've used the Pico with Windows and Linux for the last two weeks, and it's worked fluidly with both, no problems. But I'm, my my take on this would be use the system that you're happiest with, if you're comfortable with. That so way you get the least friction. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, they they state that they support Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, right? Uh, is that right, Les? I seem to remember seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. The documentation goes into it at length, exactly how you set up a dev environment three different ways on each platform, which is above and beyond. Uh, Tim also asks, just getting into Arduino ESP 822.32 uh, and looking at Pi, would it be best to settle on one piece of hardware or integrate them all? I think, I mean, if you want Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, you're not going to be using the RP2040. Um, it, again, this is one of those things where it comes down to what you're trying to achieve, I think. For me, if I was coming into the world of microcontrollers as a, a relative beginner and the RP2040 did what I needed it to do, it would be a very tempting option purely because of the quality of the documentation in SDK. So There is a, a model of the RP2040 coming out from Arduino that is going to have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Yeah, the, the, is it the Arduino Connect or it's something like that? But yeah, they're putting some sort of Wi-Fi. In fact, we're yeah. doing uh, a Wi-Fi module as well, which yep. is coming out at some point in the next couple of weeks. You heard it here first. For the Pico, too. Cool. For the Pico, yeah. It's just a, an SD card slot, so you can host things like... For real? Um, it says, yes, smiley face, because I got the firmware to work on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> the SD card slot, so you can host things like HTML files for a web server or um, you know, uh, download images of cats. And then there's uh, an ESP32 module that does the actual communications. Yeah. So you could run a web server on it? Yeah, easily. Wow, what, what, what you you could program you what what code would you use for that? Um, well, basically the 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 code that we will provide our our support for that board will allow you to do everything you need to set up things like TCP sockets and and make communications. Once you've got that running, literally running a web server is just responding to appropriate text commands. It's not particularly difficult. In fact, we we might. We might even bundle something in to do that because it's kind of an interesting use case. Um, yeah, no, no question. Uh, Jeff Gearling says it seems like oh well we know 16 megabyte says it seems like Arduino's is going to have 16 megs of flash. So and, yep. and wireless. So yeah, uh, wireless wireless will be a possibility. It's am just amazing how many different RP2040 boards do we know about now? At least half a dozen. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the one of the really exciting things about this is that Pi are letting us all use the chip, right? Yeah. It's that that's yeah. that's new, and obviously they couldn't do that before with Broadcom and the the limitations of that relationship. But because they, I guess, own everything about this, they can do what they want, which is awesome. Wow, Definitely. we're reaping the benefits. Yeah. <laughs> wow, fan, oh, yeah. Fan, yeah. Well, not that's the kind of hidden thing about this. This is the Pico is a good hobbyist board for us to play with, but the chip for anyone who develops USB peripherals, microcontroller stuff, you know, it's going to be a low cost powerhouse. They're going to want to use it. And like a year that, from now, there will be products using this right on the market. And that quality of documentation and um, SDK yeah. and just general kind of halo of, of good quality around the whole thing means that. It's great for us to use it, but it's great for our customers to get products that use it as well, because you know it only helps them as much as it helps us develop the product. Yeah. And Raspberry Pi is unique in that it has such a big community. You're going to find something similar to what you're looking for online. There's so many forums. People are going to be into what you're trying to figure out if you don't know how to do something. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Les, what are some of the projects that you've you've been working on with it? I've been working on a myriad of projects recently for this. Um, the first one is is the basic hello world, the flashing of an LED, the one that proves that our hardware is working. We've all done that. We've all got to do that with a new board. It's it's like a rite of passage. So that one I've done, it works, I'm happy. I moved on something a little more in depth. So I'm just going to go quickly to the overhead camera so you can see what I'm holding in my hand. I've got, it looks like a squid, but it's a a PIR (laughs) sensor, a passive infrared sensor. These are cheap. They're about two pounds, so maybe $3 on uh, eBay. And they've just got a really simple sensor. Try and get it in shot, usually helps. Here we go. And it just has a one output pin and power on ground. And the output pin switches from high to low. So when something moves in front of the sensor, it goes from a high signal to a low signal. And it sends a really simple signal over to Pico. And I can use it to trigger um, just like an alarm or a light, whatever I fancy. So I've been messing around with that to create a new tutorial. And that's going to be coming out rather soon. So the first tutorial is out already. They're getting started. And the soldering guide is out as well because we all need to solder on the pins the right way up as well. <laughs> yes. so if you were soldering upside down, you knock yourself out. It's your Pico, right? Yeah, yeah. I put right I, angled headers on the next one then. Yeah. I did I did just I did just that. This is uh this is my my initial project here. A little hard to see, but you can see my uh mine is upside yeah. down. Uh, Death of Pico. Yeah. <laughs> so I had uh, done some code on here because my son and I were trying to figure. So it, it will blink some lights for you, and then you know we were trying we were fixing the joystick. So if you follow the lights, you know up is like up is a call green and down is red. I think I did the wrong one. Now it'll do these at random, and then you will um, you have to match the pattern. And if you don't match the pattern, you lose. But if you match the pattern. It increases the the complexity next time, and just keeps going up by one. So uh, this is kind of basic. We're working on a tutorial for this. I'm going to add a buzzer to it, so it makes so it makes some noise. And we were talking about, although I think we've seen some issues with this. I don't know if any of you have tried uh, adding an LCD adding an LCD screen to it, like one of those. Um, uh, you know, eight, two by uh, two by sixteen LCD. These are the classic Hitachi ones that are used in every piece of industrial equipment ever. Yeah, uh, I know. Uh, yeah, that. That's it. So, <laughs> so I know there were some issues because this is only three point three volts, uh, and those tend to tend to want five volts. Have Have any of you tried one of those? And it, does it work with three point three? It, it, we we actually carry a variant of that that's specifically designed for three v three. If Les shows us the back of that board again, well, then, it might it may even have the landings for the the extra components that are needed to make it three v three. There's probably some unpopulated stuff on the left. Yep. Yeah. So basically, they do a variant of that where the those left hand pads are populated that makes the whole thing three v three instead of five volts. So uh, um, go. On. Yeah, that's one of the things I found a little bit interesting is why uh, is why did uh, why did Raspberry Pi go? I mean, I guess we're going to have uh, Evan Upton on the show on Tuesday, but do you think that the five the lack of a five volt output is is an issue? I I don't think so. I mean, Pico the power supply for Pico is quite cleverly designed to allow you to uh, hot swap between. VBUS so as in USB power and an external battery or external source that could be anywhere from I think like 1.8 volts up to what's the limit Paul does it go beyond 5, 5. volts 5.5 5. 5. so on on Pico one thing that's quite unique about it and that you won't find on any of those cheap clone Arduinos is that the power supply has a uh, buck boost converter which is up here in the near my finger and that means that uh, instead of this the classic kind of linear dropout regulator that you would get on most cheap boards where you give it 5 volts and then it just burns away 1.7 volts to produce 3v3 for the processor, this board can take any voltage between 1.8 up to 5.5 volts via there's an I.O. pin down the side that you can inject it into and it will produce the stable 3v3 that the 
the, the rest of the board needs. And that's pretty unique in the microcontroller world, and it makes it ideal for powering off things like AA batteries, off the full range of a LiPo. LiPos are awkward because they start at about 4.2 volts, but they finish at about 3. So they cross, they transition across that 3V, that magic 3v3 number, which means you can't just boost them. You can't just uh, drop them out. You have to have a more complex power supply. Um, and the one on Pico is uh, is very competent at that. So I think I think they've made the right choice. They've, they've produced a board that has the most flexibility rather than worrying about things that you don't necessarily need a five volt rail. What, what are you trying to do with it? Run like APA 102s or something? Well, I mean, like some of the, obviously some of, some of those lights or whatever they want, you know, they, they require or recommend five volts for the output. I mean, you can, so long as you're happy to go USB powered only, you can always tap off the VBUS pin. Yeah. And that is five volts, as long as there's USB power there. But oh, yeah. the, the the caveat is that most devices that you power at five volts want the the logic levels to be five volts as well. So they they will usually specify something like 0 0.7 times VDD as the logic high trigger, and awkwardly that's 3.5 volts. So there's no guarantee they'll even signal correctly if you don't level shift all of your signaling as well. Yep. So this keypad I'm showing here, this has five volt signaling because they're APA 102s and they will work with 3v3 more or less, but we've just put a couple of uh, level shifters in there running off five volts and off it goes, it works fine. But so, that's a good example of a board. You must power that one via USB. It won't work off yeah. that kind of uh, external battery input pin. Got it. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, this is this has just been so exciting, and we know people can go to Pimeroni right now and order and order a bunch a bunch of these products. And you said some more of them are going to be coming out in the next few weeks. Yeah, I mean we've got Breakout Garden coming, of course, uh, very important to us, Breakout Garden. And I'm trying to think what what else is in the VGA pipeline. Demo. The the VGA demo board we will have in limited quantities, I hope, sometime next week. But we are, shipping is a bit messed up. Lead times are awful at the moment. It's, it's absolute chaos in the electronics industry, frankly. And um, we're waiting for deliveries of various bits. But yeah, I think we'll get the demo boards out in, in small quantities next week and then more substantially in, in early February. We have obviously the Tiny coming, which we're super excited about because it's very cute. We also have a, a an equivalent to the Pico itself, so it's exactly the same format and pinout, but it has the LiPo charge circuit on there, um, mm -hmm. and that's just to make battery powered projects more convenient. Basically, is that a big flash as well? It does have big flash, so this one goes. I think this one goes up to sixteen megabytes. We'll probably have a Ooh. couple of variants that you can choose from there. Is that USB C um, as well? It is. I'm afraid we're all in now. We're all in USB-C. We've found a decent connector that we like and isn't hideously overpriced. So that's it for us. And it looks like a gaping mouth. So it's great. It looks great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to uh, strongly uh, agree with that choice. I mean, it's it's kind of a shame that the that the Pico still comes with micro. I guess it's just less expensive. They're but they are both less expensive, but it's ubiquitous of pulls. Point is is the relevant part, I think, for schools especially and things like that. If you're paying four dollars for a computer and then having to spend another three per cable, it kind of blows the concept a little bit. And Pi, I think, are very careful to consider that kind of thing. Yeah, but uh, that's that's just so great. Well, I want to thank I want to thank you guys for joining us. This this has been really awesome. We really look forward to seeing uh, to seeing all these new Pimeroni products uh, and how they're going to really revolutionize how people work with the Pico. Uh, thank you to Les and Ash for coming on short notice and to all of you who watch. We are going to have a lot more Pico content going live on tomshardware.com over the next few days. We're trying to get something new up every day. And on Tuesday, our regular day for the show, uh, Raspberry Pi founder Evan Upton is going to join us to talk Pico. So thanks everyone and we will we will see you again soon. See you soon. Thanks.